Okay, so welcome, welcome back, everyone. So this week I want to discuss uh, Ratner's theorem and the Oppenheim conjecture, but I'm going to really try to flesh out the contents so that you don't just sort of see these detached conjectures, but you see uh, how they fit in with the ideas we've discussed so far and some other broader considerations. So let me start by recalling uh, Ratner's theorem. And I'll just state the topological version. There's also a version for ergodic measures. Um, this is the topological version. So the setting is uh, G is a connected A group. And um, gamma is a lattice. And uh, U contained in G is a closed subgroup generated by unipotent elements. And, uh, and then the conclusion is that we know what the orbit closures are for every uh, element of gamma mod G. So inside of gamma mod G, we pick an element, x, we take its orbit under u, and we take the closure. And the miracle is that this is always a geometric uh, object. It's equal to just the orbit of x under some other connected, uh, some other lead group, Lee subgroup g, some other closed subgroup uh, j, rather, contained in, uh, in, in g. So, orbit closures are geometric. And let me add a little bit of comment here. So of course, the orbit under J is closed because this side is closed. And actually, this has finite J volume. That is, we can think of this as a homogeneous space for J, since J acts transitively on XJ. And it's isomorphic to the quotient of J itself by a group that I'll call gamma J. And uh, gamma J is just the subgroup of J that leaves X fixed. So gamma is the subgroup of everything in G that leaves x, uh, sorry, a conjugate of gamma is the subgroup of g that leaves everything fixed. And that conjugate is uh, x inverse gamma x. That's the stabilizer of x in g. And you intersect this with j. And, uh, and this is a lattice in j. OK, so, so that's the statement of Ratner's theorem. It's a very strong rigidity result for orbits of unipotent actions on homogeneous spaces. And um, I want to point out that there's a consequence of this caveat here, that this has finite J volume, or that this is a lattice in, um, in J. Not every Lie group contains a lattice. So um, I'll show you an example of that in a moment. But this implies that J is, um, is uh, not just a subgroup of G. Uh, and of course, it's a subgroup that lies between U and G itself. Um, but it's also unimodular. That is, it contains a left and right invariant um, uh, volume form. And we saw some examples of groups that are not eudemodular uh, and do not contain lattices um, early in the, in the course. And so I'll show you how, why that's important when you're applying Ratner's theorem. It helps you limit the possibilities for J. It's, since we're in the setting of Lie groups, it's pretty easy, or at least it's a, easy, it's a basic algebraic exercise to figure out what the possibilities are for J. Um, and this condition helps you limit them even further. 
than just taking every subgroup between u and j, g. Okay, so let's, as a corollary or example, let's prove Hedlund's theorem. So if g is SL2R and gamma log g is compact, corresponds to the unit tangent bundle of some compact Riemann surface, and u is our unipotent subgroup n, 1, 2, 0, 1, r, uh, then the corollary is that um, is, is going to be that xn bar, uh, sorry, I should have said here by that volume. So we allow a cusp. And then the corollary here is that xn bar is equal to either xn or to xg. In other words, there's only two possibilities for j. It's either n itself, in which case the orbit started out being closed, or it's g, in which case the closure is everything. So that's a, that's a way of saying in symbols and the language of Lie groups, every horocycle orbit in T1x is closed or dense. So in this case, remember that this, this orbit Xn has to have finite n volume. And that means that this, is, this quotient here gamma n log gamma n, this is a lattice in n, and n is just a copy of r. So a lattice here is just a copy of z, so this must be a circle. And that just means that x is fixed by some non-trivial unipotent element, which means that x corresponds to the tangent vector to a closed for cycle. Okay, so this is one, one possibility for, um, for, uh, for xn is it might be a closed order cycle, and then it says, aside from that possibility, every orbit is dense. That's the dichotomy that we proved directly with Hedlund. Now, how do you deduce this from Ratner's theorem? Well, we've almost completed the deduction. There's just one issue, which is, did we really find all of the subgroups between U and G? So we have N, which is one dimensional, and then we have G, which is SL2R, it's three-dimensional. And is, is it possible that there's a J in between N and G that we forgot about? It would have to be bigger than N, but smaller than G. Therefore, it would have to be two-dimensional. So is there a subgroup of SL2R that contains N, but is neither N nor G? So can anyone think of such a subgroup, a two-dimensional subgroup of SL2R? A-N. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So Catherine pointed out there's this famous subgroup A-N that we've been doing a lot of work with. This is the subgroup corresponding to the transformations X goes to AX plus B acting on the boundary of the upper half plane or acting on, um, on the upper half plane itself, it's the matrices that are upper triangular. So they look like lambda, lambda inverse, and then they can have whatever they want in the upper, uh, upper right-hand corner. They're upper triangular matrices. And in fact, up to conjugacy, that's the only other possible possibility for J. So why didn't I have to write X A N here as one of the possibilities. Well, one, one reason you know you don't have to write X A N is we proved earlier that in this setting, every orbit of A N is dense. But I don't want to use that fact. I want to use Ratner's theorem directly. So why does Ratner's theorem rule out A N? So uh, the reason it rules out A N is that A N is not unimodular. And there's two ways you can prove this. One is to show it, or is to show directly that it does not contain a lattice. So it can't be a candidate over here. 
you'll have a hard time providing AN with a cofinite volume subgroup. And the reason is that as soon as you have a translation and a dilation in AN, as soon as you have x goes to 2x and x goes to x plus 1, for example, then you can conjugate x goes to x plus 1 by x goes to 2x. You'll get x goes to x plus a half, and then a quarter, and then an eighth, and it won't be a discrete subgroup of AN. So in fact, AN contains no lattice. Uh, here's a different way to show that it's not unimodular, and this is going to play a big role over and over again when we discuss property T, is that if this were unimodular, there would be an invariant measure for G acting on AN. So in, remember that G mod AN is isomorphic to the unit circle. And the action of SL2R on the unit circle, it preserves Lebeg measure as a measure class, but it certainly is not measure preserving. So there's no invariant measure here. And that implies that AN is not unimodular. If it were, there would be a G invariant measure on G mod AN. Um, okay, so that's why this group can be ruled out, and that's uh, how you deduce Ratner's theorem, uh, Hedlund's theorem from Ratner's theorem. So that's one sample application. Um, okay, so I think the theorem is fairly easy to remember. I'm going to about to erase it. Oh, maybe I'll erase this, since this is, after all, Hedlund's theorem, which we know. Um, so what I want to emphasize is that you know, when we first proved Hedlund's theorem, we proved that on a compact Riemann surface, the Horace cycle flow was minimal. Every orbit was dense. But then when we went to finite volume, we had to add in these exceptions. And what Radner's theorem says is there's a, you can list all of the exceptional orbits in a very simple way by finding the groups that lie between U and G. Now, we already know that provided U is compact, its action is ergodic. So almost always J is equal to G. But what Ratner's theorem says is you can predict all of the exceptions as well. All of the exceptions come between the groups between U and J, and they arise because X has an unusually large stabilizer. This gadget here is the stabilizer of X inside of J. That has to be big, it has to be a lattice, and, um, and that's where the exceptions come from. Um, okay, so let me give you another corollary of Radner's theorem that I like very much. It was first proved by uh, Nimish Shaw. Um, and I'll say it this way. So let uh, F, well, let's let M3 equal gamma mod H3 be a let me just for convenience say compact hyperbolic three manifold. And um, let uh, F from H2 into M3 be a, uh, be a totally geodesic plane. So this is just a two dimensional version of, of a, a geodesic on a surface. So when you, when you take a geodesic on a surface, you just, you take H2, you take the equa equator in H2, and you project it down to your quotient surface. Or not necessarily the equator, but any geodesic uh, upstairs. And in higher dimensions in H3, what you would do is you would take the equatorial plane in H2, as a typical example, that's a copy of H2 and H3, and you project it down into your three manifold. And then you get some sort of immersed two dimensional object. And, um, and then the theorem is that either uh, F of H2 is dense or 
of H2 equals M2 immersed into M3 is an immersed compact surface. And F is a covering net. So to be really pedantic about it, what it means is there's a map from H2 to some surface sigma, which is compact, hyperbolic surface. And then there's an immersion of this into M3. And F factors through this compact quotient. So in other words, there's no intermediate or exotic behavior of geodesic planes inside the three manifold. The, the behavior of geodesics can be very complicated. They can, the closure can be transversely a cantor set. But here, the image of a plane is always dense, except in the, in the, in the miraculous case where there happens to be a surface inside the three manifold. So somehow inside of this three manifold, there's, there's a compact, totally geodesic surface. And then F just happens to be the covering map to that surface. OK, so how do you deduce this theorem from Radner's theorem? In fact, you can deduce a sharper theorem, which says something about what happens in the frame bundle of M. So to deduce this kind of theorem, and I'm going to be shortly erasing Radner anyway, so I'll write it over here, um, we take G to be SL2C, which is isomorphic to the isometry group of hyperbolic free space, at least if we mod out by plus or minus the identity. And then for U, we take the stabilizer of this hyperbolic plane. Now you can think of this hyperbolic plane as being the equatorial plane with the equator being the real axis on the Riemann sphere. So we take U to be equal to SL2R. And then again, we have to check that there are very few Lie groups between SL2R and SL2C. And in fact, in this case, there are no connected Lie groups between them. It's the only possibilities for J are one or the other. It's either SL2R or SL2C. And, uh, and then, Gamma mod G becomes the frame bundle of the three manifold. And uh, this orbit XU becomes the tangent planes to the immersed, uh, the, the tangent frames to the immersed plane you get by mapping a hyperbolic plane in. And then the claim is either this copy of SL2R intersects gamma in a lattice, in which case we get a sublattice of SL2R. Its quotient gives this compact surface here. That's the miraculous case. Or the plane is dense. And then it's not only dense in the three manifold, but it's dense in the frame bundle of the three manifold. So that's another very geometric application of Ratner's theorem. OK, so both Hedlund's theorem and Shaw's theorem are rather uh, geometric in spirit. Um, what I wanted to emphasize here is that there's this hypothesis in Ratner's theorem that um, U is generated by unipotence. And you might think, oh, that means U always has to have some sort of upper triangular shape to it. But that's not the case. Notice that here U is SL2R. SL2R is not upper triangular matrices. Um, but SL2R is generated by upper and lower triangular matrices, and those are unipotent. So there's enough unipotent elements in SL2R to generate it. And in fact, a great many Lie groups are generated by, uh, by unipotents. So there's lots of possibilities uh, for you that go beyond the sort of most obvious ones, the sort of upper triangular ones. And in particular, Hedlund had to do with porous cycles, but Shaw has to do with totally geodesic planes, which don't feel very horocyclic. But the reason they're connected to Ratner's theorem is that on 
every hyperbolic plane, there are lots of horror cycles. And somehow it's the fact that these horror cycles are very rigid and there's plenty of them in the hyperbolic plane that allows one to make this analysis. Okay. Um, so now I want to state uh, a target. So our target is going to be to show that Ratner's theorem implies um, a theorem that sounds like it's a theorem in number theory. Um, and it is sort of at the boundary of dynamics and number theory uh, and Diophantine approximation, especially. So this is called Oppenheim's conjecture. Okay, so what does Oppenheim's conjecture concern? It is, maybe I should could state it and then I'll, I'll explain the terminology. And, the, and there's a lot to say about the background to this conjecture. So um, let Q mapping Rn into R be a quadratic form of indefinite signature. EQ. Suppose that P plus Q, which is N, is greater than or equal to three. And suppose an important quantity, which is so important that I'll write it down over here, called M of Q. So what M of Q is, is it's the smallest value that this quadratic form assumes on in, for integral points. So it's the imp of the values of q of x such that x is a non-zero vector of integers. That's the arithmetic aspect of this theorem. So suppose you have an, in, an indefinite form and suppose m of q is positive. In other words, you can't find integers to plug into this form to make it very small. For some reason, it's bounded below. Now, why might it be bounded below on the integer lattice? Well, you can always represent this quadratic form in the following way. You think of x in, as being a row vector, And then you write your quadratic form as a matrix, x, q, x transpose. So this is an n by n symmetric matrix. In other words, the values of the quadratic form are the sum over i and j of q i j, x i, x j. Indeed, this matrix gives you an associated bilinear form. And we say that Q is integral if all of these matrix entries are integers. But if all of these matrix entries are integers, and if X, I, and X, J are integers, then provided this number is non-zero, it has to be bigger than or equal to one. <laughs> so Q is integral if its matrix is uh, it's given by integers, so it can be written down as a quadratic polynomial with integer entries. Um, and, uh, and we say Q does not represent zero if whenever Q of X is equal to zero and X is an integral vector, this implies x is equal to zero. So there's no interesting solutions to this equation. The sum of qij xi equals j is equal to zero. No interesting integral solutions. So notice that if q does not represent zero, then since its value on the integers is an integer, 
This implies, I should have put absolute values in here, that it takes at least the value one on every non-zero integral vector. So this implies m of q is greater than or equal to one. So that's the obvious way to keep the values of the quadratic form from getting small, is you force them to be integers. <laughs> So that when you plug in integers, you get integers out. Um, okay, so um, are there other ways you can keep uh, m of q from getting too small? And the answer is no. So, or at least that's what Oppenheim conjectured, and it turns out to be true. So the conclusion is q is proportional to an integral form. OK, so that is the statement of Oppenheim's conjecture. Uh, and there's a, there's a reduction that you can make that's very easy. Um, if you want to prove this when n is large, you can, it's enough to prove it uh, on some sort of, on, on enough rational slices of your space Rn. And so you can, in fact, reduce to the case where n is equal to three. And when n is e equal to three, there's only one interesting indefinite signature up to sign, which is two one. So now you don't really need P and Q. Um, and so that's the statement of the, of the reduced form of the conjecture. If you have an indefinite quadratic form in three dimensions, and it does not assume small values on the integers, it must be because it is itself essentially an integral form. Now, why do I say this has something to do with Diophantine approximation? Well, the idea is that the picture in R3 is basically that Q is defining some sort of Minkowski space. It's just, it's not our standard Minkowski space. So there's some sort of, um, there's some sort of uh, level set for Q. Let's say this is where uh, the values of Q of x are equal to epsilon or minus epsilon, just for fun. There's also this high, other hyperboloid, hyperboloid where q is equal to plus epsilon. And remember, as you go off to infinity, these hyperboloids get closer and closer together. They converge to the light cone. And then sitting inside of R3 is our integer lattice. Now, to say m of q is positive means that we've miraculously chosen these two hyperboloids so that there are no integer points between them. There's a region like this that's completely devoid of integer points. And that's pretty hard to check because you might go out to a very large ball and find that there are no integral points, but that doesn't mean that if you go farther, you might not eventually find some. Um, so the question is, how could you ever guarantee that this region where Q is between plus or minus epsilon is devoid of integer points? In Oppenheim's conjecture, which is now a theorem due to Margulis, Tani, and Ratner, it's a special case of Ratner's more general theorem, uh, is uh, that this is true. Um, okay, so to so I want to put this whole discussion in context by discussing quadratic forms, and once we've warmed up to it, it will be very easy to deduce it from Ratner's theorem. Um, but I want you to get you, give you a really good feel 
for what this theorem says. And I also want to explain why this function m of q comes up so often. It's very natural. And I also want to explain why you put n is equal to 3 here. You might say, well, isn't this also true for quadratic forms on R2? And by the way, if you, why do you use indefinite forms? Well, obviously for a definite form, you would just be talking about the, um, the level sets of Q are spheres. This is the definite case. And of course, if you take the radius of the sphere to be small enough, then the only integral point inside the sphere will be zero. So, um, so for any definite quadratic form, m of q is positive. You can't possibly make such a conclusion. What's, what's remarkable is that if you have an indefinite form, it becomes harder to stay away from the integral points, and it becomes so hard that there's only one way to do it, and that way means q is essentially given by arithmetic. Okay. So now, uh, with this as motivation, I want to give the broader context. Um, and to start this discussion of the broader context, I want to start with a discussion of convergence of compact sets. in Rn and various other spaces. So let me first ask the following question. On the unit circle, we take the nth roots of unity. So there's a, inside of S1, we have a subgroup, let me call it gamma n. This is the nth roots of one. This is sitting inside the complex plane. And of course, this is a discrete set isomorphic to Zn. What is the limit of gamma n as n goes to infinity? Now, you might say, well, you have to define what you mean by a limit of these sets. But I'm not going to define it, because I think the limit is obvious. <laughs> so what is the limit of these sets as n goes to infinity? Louder? The entire circle? Yeah, it's the entire circle. They get denser and denser in the circle. And so the only reasonable closed set you could describe as their limit is the circle itself. And in fact, this has nothing to do with the circle. If I were to draw a Jordan curve in the plane, and then I were to take a discrete set of points on this curve, let's call those xn on the curve x, as I let them get denser and denser, it's pretty clear that in some natural sense, xn converges to x. And indeed, there's a notion of distance between the space of compact subsets of a compact topological space or a compact metric space, uh, which makes this, these considerations rigorous. So let me define uh, the following abstractly of x d is a metric space. And let's say it's compact. That makes life a little bit easier, even though we'll want to deal with the non-compact case. And we can associate to this k of x, which is the set of compact subsets, k contained in x. And now we can define a distance function between any pair of compact sets. And this distance is defined as follows. You take the smallest r such that the neighborhood of k1 of radius r contains k2, and the neighborhood of k2 of radius r contains k1. So two sets are close if when you thicken them slightly, you get almost the same set. So here, I have a rather dense subset of the Jordan curve. If I blur my eyes slightly, 
and take an epsilon neighborhood of this subset, it's pretty close approximation to an epsilon neighborhood of the curve itself. And if I think in the curve, of course the curve itself contains the subset. So that the limit curve contains Xn, well that neighborhood condition always holds, but also as this set gets denser and denser, a small neighborhood of it contains the Jordan curve and that neighborhood gets smaller and smaller as well. So this is called the Hausdorff distance between compact sets. And then a beautiful theorem, not at all hard to prove, is that the space of compact sets, sorry, let me give this a different letter. So the little d was my original metric. This is my metric on the space of compact sets. The space of compact sets in the Hausdorff topology is itself compact. So if you have any sequence of compact sets, they have a convergent subsequence in the sense that you're seeing here. So that's a very powerful uh, idea that allows one to deal with limits of very general objects, especially objects that might be assuming some sort of exotic shape. Now, suppose I wanted to take limits of closed sets instead of compact sets. Like suppose if I wanted to take limits of subsets of Rn. Well, there's a simple way to do that, which is I replace Rn by its one point compactification. I put it on the nth sphere. And then I put a metric on the nth sphere and I play this game. And then whenever I have a closed subset of Rn, I just throw in the point at infinity. And now it's a compact subset of the nth sphere and then I can look at convergence in this sense. And that notion of convergence uh, is, uh, is um, a, you again have a compactness result. And what it means is that when you're looking at a picture of the compact sets, of the closed sets, in any ball, they converge in, in this sense. And as you take the ball larger and larger, they continue to converge. So for x equals rn, we similarly, uh, sorry, x not equals rn, we similarly set x, x equal rn union infinity, which is isomorphic to the n sphere, which is compact. And then we define k naught of x naught to be the set of closed subsets. F contained in Rn. And we map this bijectively to uh, the subsets, well, let's say injectively, into the, into the compact subsets of the sphere by taking F to F union of point at infinity. And that gives a Hausdorff topology on the space of closed subsets of Rn. And again, this space is compact. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is I want to give um, another proof of an important theorem that's going to underlie our discussion going forward, which I stated last time. But I, I, I want to give a very soft proof of this theorem using Hausdorff's idea. So uh, this is uh, Mahler's theorem, Mahler's compactness criterion we discussed before. So let's let Ln be the set of lattices lambda in Rn such that the volume of Rn mod lambda is um, equal to one. The so-called unimodular lattices in Rn. And as we discussed last time, you can think of this space as being isomorphic to SLNZ mod SLN R. In other words, it's a G mod gamma, with G being SLN R and gamma being this lattice SLNZ. And the way this works is uh, you think 
of a Zn as row vectors. And then if you have G in SLNR, you associate it to the lattice lambda, which is your standard lattice Zn multiplied by G. So G is a matrix, and if you multiply it on the, the right by, um, on the left by integral row vectors, you get some more row vectors. And so this is, this is sitting inside of it. And every unimodular lattice arises in this way because if you choose a basis for lambda, well, after permuting the basis, that gives you a matrix of determinant one because the co-volume is one. So this is the space of all lattices and the G's that send Zn into itself are just SLN Z. So that is the space of lattices. And then Mahler's theorem is the following. So I'm gonna let the norm of lambda be the inf of the absolute value of the non-zero vectors in lambda. This means the ordinary absolute norm on R2. Um, and his theorem is that the set of lattices such that the length of the shortest vector is greater than some constant r greater than zero, you want to call it ln of r, is compact. Okay. Now, the one, one thing you might wonder when you look at the statement of this theorem is, what does it mean to say it's compact? What is the topology on the space of lattices? Well, that's this topology. It's the quotient topology on G mod gamma. So we've been dealing with this a lot. Whenever you have a closed subgroup of a Lie group, you have a quotient space with a nice topology. So that's the sense of compactness. But here's another way to think about compactness. You can also think of a lattice as a closed subset of Rn. The space of closed subsets of Rn is compact. So, um, so you might just take the topology on the space of closed subsets of Rn and um, and, and ask, and it let take the induced topology on the set of lattices. So you would say a set of lattices converges to a limiting lattice if they just converge as closed subsets of Rn in this Hausdorff topology. And it turns out that that topology is the same as the ordinary topology on the space of lattices. So this is compact in G mod gamma or in the space of closed subsets of Rn. Now, what I want you to notice is that you might say, oh, well, then that must follow trivially from this because the space of closed subsets is compact. But it doesn't. The space of lattices is not closed <laughs> in the space of closed subsets um, for the following reason. You can easily make lattices whose limit is not a lattice. So, for example, if you take lambda n contained in R2, or let's say even contained in C, let's take this to be the lattice Z times 1 over n plus Z times n i. Okay, so, a fundamental domain for this lattice looks like this, 0, 1 over n, n times i. So this gives a sequence of closed uh, subgroups of the complex plane. And it has a convergent subsequence. In fact, it converges in the Hausdorff topology. So what is the limit of lambda n as a subset of the complex plane? As n goes to infinity, what closed subset does this get closer and closer to? The real axis? Yes, exactly. So 
the points up here are getting higher and higher. They eventually disappear from the picture. They have no effect on the limit. On the other hand, the points here are getting closer and closer together, just like the roots of unity were getting closer and closer together. So on the limit, we get just the entire real axis and nothing else. So the limit is the real axis. Okay, so one thing you'll notice is that in the limit, we still get a group. It's easy to prove that the set of subgroups of the complex numbers, closed subgroups, is closed in the Hausdorff topology. Um, but the group might stop being discrete in the limit. It might stop being a lattice. And we want to prevent that. So how do we prevent it? Well, the problem here was that we got vectors in the lattice that were getting too close to zero. And that's exactly what Mahler's criterion prevents. It says if you keep the length of the shortest vector in your lattice away from zero, then the limit will still be a lattice. So the proof of Mahler's theorem is the following. So first, we can, uh, given a sequence lambda n in LNR, pass to a subsequence such that lambda n tends to some group delta contained in Rn in the Hausdorff topology. So delta is a closed subgroup. It's a closed set. And as I mentioned, it's easy to prove that the group operations persist in the limit. Now, what do we know about delta? Well, all along, we have this picture instead of the counterexample picture. Namely, in Rn, we have the origin, and then we have the ball of radius R, and the elements of lambda n were sitting outside the ball of radius R. So in the limit, you can't suddenly get a new point inside the ball of radius R. So what we can conclude is that delta intersect the ball around the origin of radius R, the open ball, is equal to just the origin. Because that was true all the way along. But that implies this group is discrete. Right? It's a, if you have a closed subgroup and a neighborhood of the origin is just one point, then it's a discrete group. So this implies delta is discrete. So delta is almost certainly a lattice. But how do we know that it's really a lattice? Maybe some elements of lambda n disappear to infinity, and the rank of lambda n, which was isomorphic to zn as we went along, maybe in the limit, you're going to get just a z. You've lost some of the dimension in the lattice. Well, the important point is that this statement here implies something more about the lattice. This lower bound on the radius has to be coupled with this upper bound on the volume. We haven't used that yet. And the way we can couple that with the volume is with the following fact, is there exists an R that only depends on little r, such that if you take this big ball around the origin, and you add it to lambda n, you get all of our n. In other words, a standard fundamental domain for the lattice has radius bounded above, just in terms of little r. And the way you know that is the following. So remember that there is a way to construct a standard fundamental domain for the lattice by taking the points that are closer to zero than to any other lattice point. And because of that, this lower bound on the radius, that fundamental domain for, for lambda n contains the ball of radius r over 2. So we let fn be the set of points in rn whose nearest neighbor in lambda n is the origin. 
And now we ask ourselves, how big can this fundamental domain be? Well, the fundamental domain is convex. So if it contained a point that was very far away, then it would have to contain the cone over this point. And the volume of this cone tends to infinity as the radius of its, of its vertex tends to infinity. So we just choose capital R such that the volume of this cone is equal to one. And then we know that the fundamental domain can be no bigger than, uh, than capital R. So the actual fundamental domain probably looks, is somewhat smaller, it's a nice polyhedron, but it certainly can, is contained in the ball of radius big R. And big R is just chosen so that the, the, the cone over the ball of radius R over two at this distant point has volume one. Um, so this sum covers all of Rn. And, and so in the limit, that same remains true. The ball around zero of radius R uh, plus uh, delta is equal to Rn. And this, this implies certainly that a fundamental domain for delta is compact. In other words, that Rn mod delta is, is, is a torus. In other words, that lambda is not, delta is not just discrete, but it's a lattice. Okay, so that's a rather soft proof that these limits of lattices remain lattices. And one reason I give this proof is that it has, does not use in any essential way the fact that Rn was an abelian group. If you took discrete subgroups of SL2R with the property that they avoid a definite neighborhood of the origin, that is the smallest element in the group is bound up below, they, those discrete groups form a compact set in the Hausdorff topology on discrete groups. And that's a, that's a very powerful notion that leads to Mumford's compactness criterion, for example, but it can be used applied to hyperbolic manifolds of every dimension. It's the notion of geometric convergence. Okay, so this is Mahler's compactness criterion. Okay. So now I'm going to use this criterion to, and I'm going to now um, bring quadratic forms into the picture and prove a very powerful result that allows one to produce hyperbolic manifolds of any dimension. So you'll remember when I gave examples of hyperbolic surfaces, I used things like regular polygons and various reflection groups. I used SL. SLN, Z, there were sort of a couple of constructions that might or might not generalize in any obvious way to higher dimensions. And in fact, the only one that easily generalizes to higher dimensions are the arithmetic constructions like SL2Z. But if you want to use something like SL2Z, there's a couple of problems. One is you're not getting a compact hyperbolic manifold. In fact, SL2Z, it doesn't even give you a compact hyperbolic manifold in dimension two. So it's interesting to be able to give arithmetic examples of compact hyperbolic manifolds. How do you do that? And, um, and uh, the second thing is that it's not obvious if you use some sort of integral point construction in higher dimensions that you're really getting a lattice. How would you ever know? So the theorem I'm about to state allows one to solve both of those problems and shows that there exists compact hyperbolic manifolds of every dimension. Um, and it's related to the Oppenheim conjecture, as we will see, because the Oppenheim conjecture is about forms of signature 2-1, which is, is the signature of Minkowski space. So here's the theorem. That two from Rn to R, an integral quadratic form uh, 
of any signature. Signature. But it needs to be definite. It needs to be non-degenerate. And let's let S O Q R. This is the uh, subgroup of S L N R. These are the transformations such that Q of X G is equal to Q of X. So it's the set of G that preserve the quadratic form. Or if you like the equations for matrices, it means G Q G transpose. Uh, is equal to Q. And of course, the determinant of G should be one. And then we also have inside of here SOQZ, which is the subgroup of SOQR, where you add the condition that G applied to the integer lattice is equal to the integer lattice. So it's the subgroup where both the integral lattice and the quadratic form are preserved. Okay, so in this we can just write as SLNZ intersect SOQR. Okay, so from an integral quadratic form, we get a nice subgroup inside of SLNR. It's evidently discrete. And then the theorem, I guess I can put it here, then the quotient space SLQR modulo SLQZ is compact. Okay, now as an example, yes, uh, 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 sorry, I had to have one more condition here, um, which is a quadratic form of any signature and then plus condition star, which will be essential. And star is that Q does not represent zero. Then this quotient space is compact. And so for example, if Q has signature and one, then SOQR is isomorphic over the real numbers to SON1, which is essentially the isometries of hyperbolic end space. And so we're, what we're getting is a lattice in the symmetries of hyperbolic end space and the quotient SOQZ modulo uh, H. Uh, Sorry, this is not n1, this is n minus 1, 1, since we started in our n. So I'm going to use hn minus 1, um, modulo hn minus 1, mn minus 1 is a compact hyperbolic manifold. Okay, so you have to come up with these quadratic forms, but if you can come up with enough quadratic forms that do not represent zero, then you get a lot of compact hyperbolic manifolds. And by the way, it's not so bad if the quadratic form does represent zero, at least if n is three or more, then, then what happens is the quotient is finite volume. So you still have a quite concrete way of to get, get, getting hyperbolic manifolds um, in any dimension. But it's also interesting already in dimension two. So for example, um, Let's see here. Um, this is the main obstacle that we ha have to circumvent. It's very easy to write down a quadratic form of whatever signature we want, because we just write down a diagonal form, x naught squared plus x1 squared, and so on, with plus and minus signs of the right side. What's tricky is to make sure that you don't accidentally represent 0. And the problem is, when the form is indefinite, there are infinitely many chances to represent zero. So how will you ever prove that you don't? So here's a concrete example, just to give you the spirit of what can be done. 
Suppose we take a Q of X, Y, and T. So this is going to look like Minkowski space. I'm going to take it to be X squared plus Y squared minus, uh, let's say, 67 uh, times T squared. OK, so I claim that this form does not represent 0. In other words, there's no way to solve this equation is equal to 0 with integers x, y, and t, except the obvious way where they're all 0. OK, now how would you ever prove that? I, I, don't, I can't even check mentally that 67 is not a sum of two squares. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's not. <laughs> uh, but um, how would you know that there are never any integral solutions to this? Well, there's a method which is, which is very important in number theory, which is you can prove that this equation has no solution locally. That is, you can show that for some prime, this has no solution mod p. And of course, if it had an integral solution, you could reduce it mod p. And so that would be enough to disprove the theorem. So what we observe is that, and I hope this is the case, 67 is a prime number. So if we, but actually that's not so important. <laughs> Sorry, we, we observe that 67 is equal to three mod four. Um, so 67 is equal to, uh, so 67 is, e minus 67 is equal to one mod four. So mod four, this equation becomes x squared plus y squared plus t squared is equal to zero. Now, you might say, wait, you're going to prove that this has no solutions by four, but maybe x, y, and t are all divisible by four. Well, if they are, then we can divide uh, x, y, and t with each by two. And then we'll get a new solution uh, that's closer to being on zero mod four. So we can eventually reduce to the case where these guys are relatively prime. And in particular, um, they're not all even. And so the odd one reduces to something on zero mod four. So if we have a integral solution to this equation, we can assume it gives a non-trivial solution mod four as well. And now we use the famous fact that mod four, the square of any number is either equal to zero or one. So this number is zero or one, this number is zero or one, and this number is zero or one, and at least one of them is non-zero. So when you add them up, you get one, two, or three, which is never equal to zero. Okay, so that proves there's no solution to this equation except for the trivial one. It proves that Q does not represent zero. And that means that if we take the integral transformations of R3 that preserve this strange version of the Minkowski inner product, that defines a compact Riemann surface. So that's a very interesting idea. For example, it would be really fun to try to figure out from the number 67, what is the genus? of that quotient Riemann surface. Probably it has orbifold points. What do the orbifold points look like? And you can carry out this procedure with 67 replaced by any number that's equal to three mod four. Okay, so this illustrates the power of this method to give us compact hyperbolic manifolds and in general lattices in Lie groups of, uh, of the form SOPQ. Okay, so what's the proof? The proof, obviously, <laughs> I'm trying to get a compact quotient here, and then I have this theorem about lattices, and I have SLNZ hanging around. So I want to somehow leverage Mahler's theorem to prove this theorem. So to do that, um, what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to think of this quotient space, um, 
so I, let me give some names to these groups so that our notation gets a little bit shorter. So let me call this G. Let me call this uh, SONZ gamma. And let me call uh, SOQR H. And let me call this group delta. So it also, the Greek letters are discrete and the, the uh, Latin letters are uh, Lie groups. Um, so what we want to show is that H mod delta is compact. But we have, you see, since delta is just equal to gamma intersect H, there's a map from H mod delta into G mod gamma. And this map is injective. So if we can just show the image of this map is compact, we'll be done. Now, what is the image of this map? Well, G mod gamma, you'll recall, is the space of lattices in Rn. And the image of H mod delta is just the orbit of our base point, the integral lattice Zn under H. So inside of here, we have the lattice Zn that corresponds to the identity element of the group G. And we can take its orbit under H acting on the right. And if we can show this is compact, we'll be done. Okay, so that's our goal is to show that the orbit of H on the space of lattices is compact. Now, how do you show a set is compact? You go back to real analysis 101 and you learn that compact is the same as closed and bounded. But you might say, well, what does bounded mean in this context? It means it has compact closure. So it's kind of a tautology that plus plus bounded equals compact. Still, there are two issues that we can address separately. First, is the orbit of this lattice under H even closed? If it's not closed, there's no chance that it's going to be compact. But if it's closed, then there's some hope that we can apply Mahler's criterion to prove that it's even compact. So why is it closed? So the theorem is that the orbit uh, in G mod gamma, the orbit of, um, of Zn dot H is closed. And the proof is based on the following beautiful and very simple idea, which is that if you have an orbit xh contained in g mod gamma, this is closed if and only if the orbit of gamma x contained in g mod h is closed. You can interchange the roles of gamma and h. And the reason for this is that what you're really proving in either case is that the double coset gamma xh is closed. So it suffices to prove that the orbit of gamma times x is closed in g mod h, where x is C, C, B, N. OK, now what is g mod h? Well, g mod h is the following. h is an integral, uh, sorry, h is this group, SOQR. It's conjugate to the standard quadratic form of the same signature. So h is isomorphic to SOPQ. And in fact, it's conjugate to SOPQ inside of g. Now, what is g mod SOPQ? Well, g acts transitively on the quadratic forms of signature PQ and determinant uh, of equal to one. 
So I should mention that when we write Q as a lattice, it has a naturally associated discriminant or determinant, um, which is preserved when you apply the action of SONR. So, so G mod H can be interpreted as the space, or rather it can, is contained in, no, it can be interpreted as the space of unimodular quadratic forms on Rn of signature PQ. Okay, now what's special about our form Q? The spe what's special about our form Q is that it's an integral form which means that the matrix entry, entries are integers, but you can use the matrix entries here as um, coordinates on the space of unimodular forms. So the matrix entries of Q are integers, but we're taking the orbit of this form, I should have written this as gamma Q, under the action of SL uh, and Z. We're, we're allowing integral, changes of coordinates. But if you take a matrix with integer entries and you pull it back, that is multiply on the right and left by another matrix of integer entries, it still has integer entries. So this orbit, gamma Q, is contained in the matrices with integer entries, with entries in Z. And that, of course, is discrete. So any subset is closed. So it's fact, it's obvious from the fact that this is an integral form that its orbit in under SL and Z is closed. And that implies this orbit here is closed. And that's the first step in the proof of compactness. Okay, so all we have to do now is show that the orbit of the standard lattice under H is bounded in G mod gamma. And for that, it suffices to show that this orbit is contained in ln r, ln little r, or sub r. In other words, that as you apply the action of H, you never make the, um, the, la the vectors in the lattice H times Zn uh, very close to zero. Because then, by Mahler's criterion, we have compactness. Okay, so I'm going to have to re erase the theorem, but we know what's left to prove. So, so here we have our form Q, and um, and what we know is that uh, M of Q is greater than or equal to one, since Q does not represent zero. Now, of course, Q vanishes at the origin. And so there's some neighborhood of the origin, and it might be some weird compact thing. There's some open set where, where, um, where Q is uh, of X is an absolute value which is strictly less than one. But since this is open and it contains the origin, it contains the ball of radius R. And, um, and for the ZM lattice, M of Q is at least one. And so the ZM lattice doesn't contain any elements in this region where Q is less than one. And so it doesn't intersect the ball of radius R. So ZM has to stay out here. Okay, so ZM intersect the ball around zero of radius R is just the origin. But now suppose we come along and hit this lattice with G. Well, G is in H, which is SOQR, which means G preserves this quadratic form. And that means it sends this region into itself. And so when you move Zn by an element of G, since this region is preserved, the image lattice still can't intersect that region. And therefore, this intersection is empty for all G 
in S of QR. And that implies that the whole orbit is contained in LN of little r, and therefore it's compact. Okay, so that is a, uh, is a typical proof that um, from suitable integral quadratic forms, you can construct lattices in Lie groups and therefore hyperbolic animals. And the key is the study of this quantity M of Q, the smallest value that Q assumes on an integral lattice. Um, okay, so that's the setting for the Oppenheim conjecture. And next time I'll, I'll amplify the conjecture and then explain how it follows from Radner's theory. Okay.